Okay, so I've made us go live, so we I can begin. So Gail, we're live. Yeah, aloha. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> it's a meeting of the Hawaii Hemp Task Force. It's a Wednesday, August 21st, 2024, and it's about 12.05 p.m. I guess we're going to call this meeting to order. Um, June, if you don't mind, it's it's harder for me because I, I only have one screen and I'd like to keep an eye on folks. Do you mind doing the roll call for the um, sure, meeting? Sure. Okay, thank you. So before the roll call, Gail, let's uh, um, uh, allow Stephen to uh, inform the public how they can participate on this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, there's uh, in-person access. There's also a video conference and also a telephone. So Stephen. Thank you. After everyone, uh, for internet, telephone, and in-person access, when testifying, you will be asked to identify your organization, or yourself and the organization, if any, that you represent. Each testifier will be limited to two minutes of testimony per agenda item. If internet and phone connection is lost, the meeting may reconvene when either audiovisual communication or audio only communication is established within 30 minutes. The public may access the reconvene meeting by clicking the link uh, again that you would click to be here. Um, if it is not possible to reconvene the meeting within 30 minutes after an interruption, then check the agency's website for information as to whether the meeting will be continued to an alternative date and time or the meeting may be terminated. Those of you joining uh, via internet, as an attendee, your microphone will be automatically muted during the meeting unless you are providing testimony. For each agenda item you wish to testify on, please click the raise hand button found on the Zoom screen. The task force staff will individually enable each testifier to unmute their microphone. When recognized by the tax task force meeting facilitator, please unmute your microphone before speaking and mute your microphone after you finish speaking in order to prevent audio feedback. Uh, there isn't anybody joining by phone right now, but I'll still explain in case you do in the future. Um, if you are going to, if you access this meeting via phone by dialing in, when the task force meeting facilitator asks for a public testimony, you may indicate you want to testify by entering star and then nine on your phone's keypad. After entering star and then nine, a voice prompt will let you know the host of the meeting has been notified. When recognized by the meeting facilitator, you may unmute yourself by pressing star and then six on the phone. A voice prompt will let you know that you are unmuted. Once you are finished speaking, please enter star and then six again to mute yourself. That is it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Gail, as you requested, I'll, I'll um, ask for the task force members to please acknowledge uh, and say present when your name is called. So <clears throat> the task force members include the following. Um, so Gail, Gail is there. So thank you, Gail. <laughs> then Robert Benz of Hawaii Sustainable Farm. I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Tai Chang of Hamptuary, Hawaii. Uh, Jared, the money of Hawaiian choice. Here, here, here. Thank you, Jared. Janine Holstein of Maui Majesty. Janine. She's not good. Thank you. Uh, Gloria Ilagan of Mauna Kea Trading. Uh, Kelly King of Pacific by Diesel. Present. Uh, Kyle Young of Hawaii Gold Farms. Present. Uh, Chin Lee. Um, uh, Charlene um, Pila is um, proxy uh, for Chin Lee. Thank you. Present. Kelly Matsuda of Lele. Mm 
Michele Sina. Uh, Judiah McRoberts of Kauai Hemp Company. Present. Um, Liliana Napoleon of Napoleon Gentry. Uh, Brit Neil of Hawaiian Hampstead. Present. Grant Overthorn of Agripelago. Present. Greg Smith of Earth Matters. Present. Joseph Smith of Hampstead, Hawaii. Present. Bob of Mina Ventures. Present. Scappy Wong of Ohana Ventures. Uh, present. Um, your your volume's kind of low, unless it's just me. But I hear everybody else loudly. But Scotty Wong, present. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, volume is low for me too. So, Gail, we have a quorum, so you can now proceed. Yeah, thank you. So, what's first on the agenda was to hear from the consultants. Um, Megan and Char, who have uh, worked on a you know, report <laughs> that we all got to see in full this last week, and they're going to give a um, an overview of that report before we launch into discussion. So take it away, Megan and Char. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Gail. <clears throat> and just real quick, everyone, we'll, okay. why don't we let them get through their presentation, and then we'll hold all questions till the very end. We're not voting on anything right now anyway. So thank you. Thank you. So our aim is to make recommendations that will benefit all of the sectors, the cannabinoid, the, the building sector, every sector. We see this as an opportunity to encourage the state to support the development of many new industries that will diversify and grow our state economy by producing locally made building materials, biofuels, bio value-added foods, raw materials for fiber industries, and the made in Hawaii cannabinoid industry. We are at an important juncture in Hawaiian history. We need to find crops to fill the, uh, the lands left vacant by the sugar, pineapple, and seed corn industries. And we can replace these crops with a crop that increases food security, energy independence, and primes the pump with raw materials for many new industries, thereby growing our economy. Just to reiterate for the record, hemp prepares the land for food crops by removing toxins and rejuvenating the soil. It produces the raw materials for many new manufacturing and construction industries. It can reduce our energy insecurity. It can be made into value-added foods as well as animal feed. I want to promise this group that we are committed to ensuring that all voices are heard in our report. We have been gathering recommendations and will update the report promptly, sending out a revised version with any additions highlighted. Our goal is to continue updating the report until the task force is satisfied, eliminating the need for the task force to draft its own report. I suggest that we begin with recommendations that are straightforward and likely to gain consensus. Megan and I will present each of them for discussion and a vote. Please keep the comments to two minutes per person. If there are specific points you want included in the report, it's best for clarity just to email us and to copy Gail. So I'd like to start with the first recommendation that, that will lift all votes, and that is that we are recommending a $300 subsidy, a state subsidy for hemp straw, for the production of hemp straw, and a 40 cents per pound subsidy for hemp seed. And this should help all the different industries. So Gail, it's up to you, but it would seem to me it'd be easier just to have discussion on one thing at a time and vote on it and just kind of click off the easy ones, get down to anything that's contentious. Yeah, I think we had a pretty um, thorough discussion that uh, regarding voting, um, but we really want to hear the full context, the suite of recommendations, and probably discuss things before we vote on anything. So um, um, unless there's anyone mm -hmm. else on the task force that wants to vote on it now, I, I, I think there was pretty strong consensus that we're not going to vote on anything until... We've had opportunity to discuss and hear, hear everything you guys have to say. You, you want me to read the findings and recommendations or you want me to just hit the highlights or? 
I thought we were going to agree that everybody had it and we were going to zip through it. Well, my understanding but, was that you guys were given 20 minutes today or, you know, up to 30 to give a presentation on what you felt were the important things to um, highlight and share back with us. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so the important thing is to subsidize the growing of hemp, in my opinion. That helps both the, the biofuels and the building materials and the cannabinoid. It, it helps every single sector. Secondly, we're recommending, and this again affects everybody, is that we're recommending um, two full-time hemp coordinator positions, one in the DOH, so that there can be a someone who's looking out after, for grants for the cannabinoid folks, and also is a mediator back and forth between the DOH, DOA, and the Attorney General's office. And then also a position in the Department of Ag for technical assistance for everybody. So those those first two things affect every sector. And number three is So it, it's, again, the chicken and the egg situation. If we do not have a large-scale processing plant to begin with, no one's going to grow hemp unless they're going to sell it for biofuels. And then what are they going to do with the straw? The straw is just a byproduct, and that's that's not going to work. So we're recommending that, there, that we put out, a, the state put out an RFP for a processing plant developer. <clears throat> we know approximately what it would cost if there's no pre-existing buildings, which in some islands there are. So that will be a competitive bid among the many, there are several groups I know of that would like to develop a processing plant. So the, yeah. So the equipment is about 3,300, depending on which equipment they go with. The shipping around 40,000 industrial setup, at least 2.5 million for the, for the setup and then the, you know, miscellaneous. So it comes to about six and a half million. And I'm not saying the state has to support all of that. The state can decide if they want to support through loans or grants or how they want to do it. But that's about what it's going to take to put one of those together. Um, we feel very strongly that we need a a task force for the building industry. There's just too much. If we're going to rebuild the Heine with hempcrete, we really need to get builders and growers and um, architects and engineers and permit people together to figure this out so that it goes easily. And that group can also make some pre-permitted um, plans so that it's easy for people to build with, with hempcrete. So number four and number five, we're recommending an RFP for the development of a hemp block company. And we're recommending they look at, hopefully they do the, there are two different types of hemp blocks and hopefully they will answer an RFP for both of them. Number six is that, so once the hemp is, once there's hemp herd flowing into the marketplace, it's ideal for local manufacturing of all the different hemp materials that we know of, you know, the hemp boards, the hemp flooring, the hemp insulation, but that takes research and it, it should be a local company that does that research that is capable of manufacturing those products. Now there's one company that comes to mind because it already has 600 employees and it's already in, employee owned, but it would be an open bid for that. And it's just for R and D money so that they can, go visit the different um, innovators and and research licensing their technology, which is the easiest way to do it, is just to license someone else's technology that already works, but bring it home to Hawaii and manufacture here. I'm sorry, could you, could you, I didn't quite capture the end of that for some reason. Can you say the end of so, that? So this way with new technologies is to license them, like to yeah. go to, some place where they're already making, for example, hemp wood, hemp flooring, and say, I'd like to license your technology and I'd like to, to build, to use it in Hawaii. And that's a fairly straightforward system to do. And then our next 
recommendation Megan's going to talk about. That's for the cannabinoid industry. <clears throat> Um, so our top recommendation is to um, create a cannabinoid, hemp-derived cannabinoid task force. Um, this would be able, this would make it so that you guys, everything can be discussed from regulations to infrastructure, um, because there's a lot of different feedback that we've received, as you can see in the report. It's very diverse. There's all kinds of different stuff. Um, so that's the top one that we wanted to um, put in our recommendations. Um, but I also wanted to highlight, uh, we were contacted by a task force member um, in response to the report and our findings and recs and the feedback that was provided um, after reading it really um, addresses a lot of what everyone has been saying. Um, so we're looking to include that in the report. And I just want to touch on that really quickly um, so that this will be added. Um, so I just want to go through it really quickly. Um, point number one, um, and this is, all of this stuff is already in the report in different forms, um, but we can add this to the recommendation section. So that's more clarified uh, to everyone. And then again, um, these things can also be discussed further in a cannabinoid dedicated task force. Um, point number one, the legislature has almost annually revised the rules, usually before the previous laws have even been implemented. This has introduced a lot of uncertainty into the industry with constantly changing goalposts. Um, this has hindered investment and stagnated growth. This needs to pause until the industry can get its feet and stabilize. I know we've discussed this before, but we'll make sure that's included in the RECs. Um, again, create a specific cannabinoid task force, which brings together the DOH, the Ag Office, and HDOA, along with the industry to write rules that are workable. Um, the Hawaii Department of Health needs guidance to incorporate the greater goal of the legislature, which is to create a safe but thriving and competitive industry. Um, they're behaving without regard to this intent of the legislature and seeing their mission um, is without understanding of the industry realities of mainland products arriving in Hawaii unregulated or concerns about the economic feasibility of implementing their rules by not recognizing the cost disadvantage Hawaii's farmers are at compared to the mainland industry. Um, and some specifics to go for that. Um, operate more transparency, transparently in their rulemaking, um, having public consultations, demonstrating the data behind their decision-making. Um, consult transparently experts, stakeholders, and industry to understand the feasibility of their decision-making. Um, one of the touch points that a lot of you have talked about um, is this next one, the zero and ultra low THC limits that have been suggested are totally unrealistic for Hawaii farmers and manufacturers to comply with. Um, give adequate notice of any new rules so that the industry has time to adopt minimum six months notice. Um, and this I think is one of the really, really big ones that we've touched on before, but just reiterating it is enforcement. Um, if they make rules, they need to enforce. Otherwise, they're simply affecting Hawaii businesses and putting it at a disadvantage to mainland businesses by scaring local responsible businesses while not affecting outside uh, retailers that, that are flooding the market. Um, this is critical as prohibition only works with enforcement. Um, and then lastly, this is kind of touching on the THC uh, limits. Um, specifically, if THC in the hands of children is the main concern, then they should design rules that address this, not a blanket policy which prohibits everything and destroys the industry. Um, specifically, um, some simple rules to address this, which should be legislated rather than left to HDOH discretion. Um, and those two are age gating on retail sales of all ingestible uh, or inhalable hemp products, 21 and older like cigarettes or alcohol. This would address concerns about synthetic forms falling into loopholes. And the last one is realistic THC limits that are in line with the rest of the country. Um, lowest reasonable limit would be 2.5 milligrams THC per serving and greater than 30 uh, serving per package. Um, below this is impossible, or this is impossible to comply with because Hawaii manufacturers are not held to this standard elsewhere. And so products below this are impossible to sell outside of Hawaii. Um, so I'll put these in the an updated version so you can read them because I know that was a lot to go through. But um, after reading these suggestions that were submitted to us, 
they fall into line with what a lot of you guys have been saying. So um, if you guys, if we want to discuss further, we can. But again, as Shar said, if you have um, additional feedback from today's call, we would really like to get it in writing um, in an email to Shar and myself, because um, that just helps us know exactly what you're getting at and what you want put in there. Um, but like I said, these suggestions are very in line with what a lot of you have been saying over the course of time. So uh, we will be adding these into it. So one last thing that I did forget was support for the University of Hawaii is a given. They need support to do more research into hemp. Um, yeah, we so we tried to cut them down. This we, Now we've given you eight of our top recommendations. We tried to cut it down to four to five, but we just couldn't because it's an industry that you've got to grow simultaneously. It's not a linear thing. You can't just do three or four and then do a three or four next year, it's gotta be simultaneous because of the nature of the beast. So we, we cut it down to our most essential eight things. And um, we have more recommendations, but they are for phase two, but they'll still be in the recommendations as phase two. Does, do you guys have uh, more you wanna go over? Is that I, I'm I'm ready to vote. Or yeah. discuss if you guys want to discuss not... anything that was in because you guys all got it. If you guys made notes or want to bring anything up for any of the other ones, um, I think now we can open everything up to discussion. So in terms of moving forward, I just want to um, throw out their potential templates so that we can um, move through things. And you can see my cat jumping behind me. <laughs> um, what I what I'd like to do because the goal for all of us is to have a really great report because this report is going to set the trajectory for a number of years and I know we all care deeply about this. So oh. what I'd like to do is suggest for today that we um, discuss discuss the report, the things that we think might be missing, and then if we want to, we can kind of go sector by sector to address things. But I'd like to step back for just a quick moment and then have us consider that we need to take our time, that this is a really important document that we're putting together. And if we need more time to do it beyond August 30th, I don't think the world's gonna stop. Um, you know, maybe Gail, that's something we can have. Can I interrupt you, Gail? Uh, before we proceed, uh, let's check first if there are public, uh, there is someone from the public who would like to testify before no, we proceed to discussion. <laughs> yeah, we can't see, so I, I'm so sorry. Didn't couldn't no tell if there's anyone there. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate your help. Is there sure. anyone there? There's no one from the public. Okay, um, okay. Uh, yes, um, or, or, we'll so see. we can go ahead, Gail. So there's no one from the public. So okay. Thanks, June. You'll you'll make sure we get this get through yeah. this correctly. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. You too, Travis. Um, so, uh, uh, not uh, just really quickly, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just procedurally, um, if you make a request for, um, any testifiers from the public and there aren't any, and you want to close testimony that will help because if, if, unless you want to leave it open and as people pop in, you stop the procedure and let people testify. So that's usually what, you know, boards and commissions will do is allow testimonial, um, time, and then if no one's there, then they close public testimony. So it doesn't continually get interrupted throughout the session. So that's just a suggestion. Thanks, Kelly. Do, um, do we need a motion to do that? Or can we just close that, June or Kelly? Yeah, you yeah. can just close it. All right. Well, like, seeing that there's no testifiers from the public, let's close the public testimony at this time. So so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, all right. Let, if you don't mind, let's jump into discussion about the report, um, things that um, might want to add or miss. And then um, in general terms, I'd like to suggest that. And then maybe we can go sector by sector. And then I, again, maybe we can have a little sub discussion on timing here. I really don't think we should be rushed in, the, in, in doing this. I think we need to take the time it takes to have the lengthy discussions. Um, with the sectors talking to each other, because as Kelly raised, I think last week or someone else did, um, 
you know, there are concerns potentially between the sectors that I hadn't really thought about. So it's important that we don't necessarily isolate ourselves from one another when we're talking. So I see three hands up. Grant, do you want to go first? Yeah, thank you, Gail. A um, couple of general comments over here. I've read through much of this report. Um, it's quite lengthy. Uh, I think just off comments made today, Char, uh, addressing hemp straw is not an accurate term to be using for this, for biofuel production, for RNG, and a variety of other things. It's a full crop biomass, excluding seed. So Kelly King could probably talk about seed oil and the use of that for biodiesel. Um, but the rest of the crop we are using is, uh, for RNG production via anaerobic digestion. So I think um, straw is more typically used to describe wheat. Um, typically, we prefer to call this uh, biomass. And the other major comment I have to address here is there is a table comparing industrial hemp and cannabinoid hemp in this report. And it is absolutely scientifically wrong across the board categorically um, from plant gender to flower production. And I know you guys put a lot of time and effort into this and some of the nuance can be industry specific and the result of understanding of crop science and plant biology. Uh, but it, to define industrial hemp as purely male basically excludes the entirety of the grain sector because only the female plant produces seed. So there are monoaceous or uh, crop variants of hemp that have both male and female inflorescence or flowering sites on them. But those are typically not grown in Hawaii right now due to climate incompatibility. Um, additionally, the, the cutting of this prior to flowering is even if you were going through mail, would not be happening for a biomass or biofuel type scenario. Um, you want these crops to get as large as possible. So you're terminating, say, the last 30 days of harvest capacity. That's simply not something you do for fiber production, even if you weren't producing for seed, for food, or for bio oil. Um, I'd also go into comment on the seed cost component of this. For compatibility for industrial hemp in Hawaii, seeds need to generally be high quality certified seed that is not readily available for any market segment in North America. The stuff that is available is typically varieties that come from Europe or in Northern American Canadian uh, varietals that do not work very well in Hawaii. So the affordability of, of usable industrial hemp seed that actually gets the type of yields that we're looking for is astronomically more expensive to the point where it's actually quite cheap to develop this in-house. So, uh, I think it's important to make that distinction because unless we're planning on throwing out the entire seed oil, uh, protein for food type of, of market lines that go with industrial hemp, that, that table cannot be conveyed to the legislature as this. It's, it's simply inaccurate. Um, so I appreciate the time you guys put into this. I really do. I'm not here to cause issues on this. I just think we need to convey this to protect what is very likely the most scalable value added product chains of this crop, uh, while also recognizing that this this categorization exceeds anything that's being done at the federal level. So I'm happy to clarify any of that as well today or further another comment. A point of clarification, Grant, uh, Grant thank you very much. Very helpful comments. Um, when you say categorization exceeds what's happening at the federal level, you mean the redefining of hemp that's been done in the report? Is that what you mean? Or do you mean something else? Yeah, correct. So we can report by a varietal type or a cultivar intended use case. Um, I'd also like to point out that we have Dr. Mark Merlin at UH. He is literally one of two of the most leading ethnobotanists on cannabis evolution. Uh, he wrote the actual textbook on how cannabis and hemp evolved with humans. I don't know why he was not included in this entire task force. Um, he, he's, he's considered the, the guy to talk to about this. So uh, cannabis, if we're getting technical from a species level, which differs from hemp, you classify this on the basis of uh, actual use case type, and it's vastly different from what's being proposed in this report. Uh, an agrotype based approach where you're using this by end use is closer to what's actually done with industrial hemp and cannabis at large. So this, this is not easy, I guess, to understand outside of plant sciences, but it's absolutely crucial to consider that this is what the USDA reflected. Uh, I, I think I don't need to preach any further on how we got to 0.3% THC. I'm sure folks know that one already. But uh, the, the take home for point for this is if we're looking at hemp from a value chain, from food and fiber and biomass products outside of, of uh, legal cannabinoids, which are a robust, small value added market. If we're looking at this from food, biofuel and fiber standpoint, classifying the crop the way this is presented 
basically prevents that from being done in an economically viable way and doesn't fully represent how this would be uh, available. And again, I'd like to emphasize hemp straw is not typically something we're using as an industry term. This is biomass. So, so you're, you're saying um, the reclassification using the terms industrial hemp and um, cannabinoid hemp that they do in the report is not accurate. No, I mean, I, I can go line by line through a lot of these um, of how that that's operating. Uh, but I think the point here is we're all trying to work towards a good goal. And I think, uh, Megan and Shar, I know you guys are trying to get a good outcome for the state. That's the goal here. So I do not want to come off as this is being attacking of it. Inevitably, that is going to happen when we're making scientific corrections. So I apologize for that. Um, but I think it's crucial because if this is becoming an advisement to the legislature, it needs to be accurate. And so there's there's other issues across the report that I think others want to articulate as well um, that are similar to this type of classification and how it's being considered. So, Thanks, Grant. Really appreciate so, that. Oh, can ahead. I speak to Grant? Uh, oh, sure. Grant, I don't take it. I don't take anything as a, can you hear me? I don't take anything as a criticism. I'm very happy to have you explain, correct anything. However, I take, I don't agree with what you just said. Because, and we had this discussion once before, I know that you have the belief that you can get seeds and biomass at the same time. And you can, but this biomass is going to be old and it's not going to be ideal for your for your anaerobic digester. And I've researched that and that's just true. That's so, not the case. I'm sorry, we've, we've on, proved that one. Send you, I can send you stuff that says you should, the ideal time to harvest hemp is at 90 days. Some even say 75 days, but 90 days. I know a lot of people say 115, but there are biological changes that happen during that time that make it not as good for your anaerobic digestion for one thing. And it also takes nutrients from the soil. As soon as you start you know, translocating nutrients to that seed head, you're taking nutrients away from the soil and away from the stalk. And the leaves that are going back into the soil causing it to act like a, a cover crop. So we're very different there. I'm happy to to take your feedback, to look at it, to puzzle over it, to change whatever we agree on should be changed. I, I'm not I'm not married to this report, but I do want to look at that aspect of it. And I did yeah, talk so to we'll, um we've go absolutely ahead. gotten yeah. higher biomass yields, um, letting your crop go to maturity. And I think the point here to drive home is that dual use for food and fuel is that you need to get this plant to seed. Uh, you you still harvest the crop green, the biomass yield and absolute fuel. And value chain yield for the crop is much higher. Um, I, I don't. I don't know where those reports are coming from. Ninety days would be an excessively quick cultivar unless you're pre-harvesting prior to seed production, which that defeats the food purpose of this crop. Everyone. <laughs> if yeah. you can, if you're saying you can still get high levels of NRG if you let it go to maturity. That's what you're saying. I mean, if that's true, I'm all. That's awesome. That's wonderful. That's that makes our report sad. better. Okay, then just get that information to me and we'll change it. If yeah, that's true. I, this happy. is a great discussion because what it points out is, um, well, first of all, we've got a lot of great people on the ground that have already done a lot of research. I know Grant and his crew have dumped at least over 100 grand into research with the University of Hawaii and developing some proprietary information. But it also speaks to the fact that how unique we are, <laughs> you know, and that some of the reports and findings that we have um, in other parts of the world aren't necessarily applicable. I was having a long conversation today with the um, the director of the U.S. Hemp Building Association, just specifically about that and how Hawaii is so unique, even in that in that regard. So thank you guys for that fun exchange. I think you enlightened both of us and Grant, as always. You know, hats off to you. Is there anything else you want to? Add Grant, because I know you're time limited today. Oh, that was it. And yeah, thank you everyone for contributing to this. I know there's a lot of other people that farm or work with the crop locally that have input to add to that. It's going to be extremely valuable. Thanks. Okay, um, we got a lot of hands up. Um, Kelly, do you want to go? And then I'm I'm just randomly picking hands. So. <laughs> I actually think uh, Brittany and Robert were had their hands up first, so I, I'm happy to wait for them. Okay, oh, well, um, I'll go left to right. So on my left is Brittany and then Robert. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I would just like to say that I appreciate all of the work that both Shar and Megan have put into this report. It's a huge report. I mean, I think we can all agree that hemp is an incredibly um, diverse crop with a broad range of um, 
you know, things that it can be used for, which poses some challenges with putting together this report, especially under time constraints. So first of all, I just wanted to take the time to say thank you. I think that, you know, it's, it's apparent that a lot of time and energy has been invested in that. We very much appreciate that. I did want to express a bit of a concern I have over the length of the report, just because um, this is such a broad topic. There are certain things that, in, in my opinion, may be a little bit off track from um, what was specifically outlined should be in the report. And so I'm not sure if there's a way that we can parse out some of the you know, the, the most like refine and try to cut out any of the fluff anywhere that we can, just so that the major points don't get lost in the, you know, pages and pages of the report. So, um, you know, and then the other thing too is based on something that was said at one of the other uh, task force meetings, I believe that um, the task force is able to um, kind of pull from the consultant's report and put together our own report that is the, the final report that goes to the legislature. And because of the subtle nuances that Grant even just um, expressed that might be lost by somebody that's kind of um, not as experienced within the, in the industry, I think that, that that would be something that's worth considering. And if it's possible, I would like to bring a motion that um, the task force submits our own final report um, and, and really just tries to narrow down what is in that final report so that those every single word that's in there it has the most weight because there's no distraction anymore. Um, and again, you know, there's so many things to touch on when you're looking at hemp as a whole. Um, and you guys have done some really great work. I just worry about the volume and, and the important things getting lost. So thank you. Uh, okay, let me allow, to, uh, allow me to uh, uh, reply to Brit first. There's an agenda for that, which is the, the, the third one. And this uh, agenda now is we are only discussing the findings and recommendations of the high consultant. So can we, can we focus first on that? And then after that, we can move on to uh, the motion that uh, uh, Brit, uh, uh, Brit Neil mentioned. Thank you. So I think in my mind, we merged the two, uh, June, right. so that there, there's a, the Focus consultant. First, uh, on this agenda, uh, on the discussion uh, regarding the uh, recommendations, uh, the findings and recommendations of the consultant. And then if you want to move on to the next agenda, then we will uh, discuss about what to do about the final report uh, that we will be sent, uh, that you will be sending to the legislature. Okay, Thank I'm you. trying to pull the gen up here. Can, I, okay, all right, thanks, June, appreciate that. Um, thanks, Brittany, I wrote down your motion that the task force submits the final report um, and we'll get back to that. Okay, thanks, Kelly, your turn. Do you want to go to Robert next? Oh, Robert. Yeah, left or right. Okay, Robert, go ahead. Do you need help unmuting, Robert? Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry about my technical difficulties. I really um, want to send love and appreciation to Megan and Char. It's a difficult job, but it's very, very clear that the consultants are just learning about hemp. And hemp is so, it's such a complicated thing and it's changing. And I'm on the kind of the front line of the federal definitions I'm involved with the Hawaii uh, I mean the hemp feed coalition and the whole report unfortunately it, even it being a draft that was unacceptable to the Hawaii Department of Agriculture it being on the task force if I was gonna I want to reach out other um, hemp experts 
if they check out the task force and they look at this report, it would be very embarrassing. And it has so much false uh, definitions in, in this part of farming. Definitions are so, so important. And the good ideas, a lot of it, like I had mentioned to Megan, word for word, like the no-till drill. And I just kind of off the top of my head mentioned the price. And then that was in the report. But as Gail mentioned in the first task force, we needed really, really detailed information about specific infrastructure needs. So the whole sectors I felt were not just the cannabinoid sector, all sectors were completely let down by this task force. We should have had things that were mentioned as suggestions in this final report should have been included in the task force because as Gail and Grant more eloquently than I could have already expressed, there are experts that were not included um, it's because, and there's information, it's just so much information in this report that is factually wrong, and there's no economic hemp experts, there's no legal experts, so there's so much conjecture. I think we should, and I don't think most of the legislatures are going to read a 100-page report we should draft our own report. So I'd second Brit's, Brittany's um, motion that we should write our own report and use what was good from this task force report from the consultants. But the consultants dictating how this task force was run from the beginning instead of the farmers dictating how the task force was run was really a big problem because I saw in one of the first presentations, you had all the things that you had already decided on in white. And I'd asked if we could see it. And that was really, it was the seven one was the deadline for act 263. So we would have two months. So it should have really been as soon as you had that information, because I understand you traveled to these places but the report doesn't include anything that we couldn't have just got off of a quick Google search. So I think that the next task force should be the same partner led, but we call in experts because like when Bob was talking about their plant and then he learned that he was only limited to five minutes, and we hear 20 minutes of the same things that we already read. It's, uh, there's so much expertise just on this panel alone that if the hemp farmers are allowed to just talk to each other without violating sunshine, and we're allowed to talk with the Department of Ag, and we're allowed to talk to NED, and we're allowed to talk with the attorney generals and the Department of Health. And we should have had several meetings just about mobile decorticators. And um, there, there's that $6 million. It wouldn't be economically feasible. I, um, I'm i trying to stay upbeat. So I'm trying to remember this comedy movie where the guy made all the prices, but and the guy was like, oh, you're leaving a lot of things out of there. So uh, I don't want to be pessimistic because I know that you're trying to do your best. But I really think that even this draft report should be removed from the website. Um, again, I don't I don't want to say that um, like I'm attacking you in any way because I know you're, you're trying your best, but it's so difficult um, when we know all the intricacies, but we're arguing with somebody that doesn't know the intricacies, but they've never 
growing hemp in Hawaii. But um, yeah, I would just second Brittany's motion. And again, um, sorry to sound like um, attacking you, but we were all also volunteers in um, June and the consultants are the only ones being paid for this. So I just, uh, I just want it to be more farmer driven and farmers talking to each other and the, the final report just going to the, the legislatures coming from the farmers because we love him and some of us have been in it for 20 years and people longer there's pillars of the hemp industry in this task force and i believe if now that we have gail as chair if we can kind of work together as farmers to see what the really the farmers priorities are get that into a report to the legislature i loved scotty's idea and original for the five hundred thousand dollar grants with the estimate of one plant six million dollar it could have like 10 of those five hundred thousand dollar grants and then still have money left over because kelly brought up a really good point about we have a really big ask so breaking it down into smaller asks that would be more immediately helpful would be really um awesome and this plant saved my life and i love growing it and uh I appreciate your your work as consultants, and I really appreciate the fellow task force members. Mahalo. Thanks, Robert. You know, and yeah, we are all volunteers here, so it's good to remember. And and we'll just take um, Char and Megan at their word that we're all just you know trying to make something better here. So it's not personal for sure. Um, Kelly, <laughs> I've been thank you, to everybody. No, great comments. It's it's good to hear everybody's comments. Um, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to make some comments on what was said earlier, and I can't comment too much on the the science of it. But I thought that was a great discussion between with uh, the information that Grant brought. But I do want to say that when we're we're, we're uh, that it's a little too prescriptive on the length of the crop because the length. I mean, when I look at what we're doing with sunflowers and what we're doing with some of our cover cropping. Our um, our decisions on when to harvest are not made on based on you know we don't there's no difference in nutrition between you know the two weeks whether we harvest earlier or later. A lot of our decisions are being made on um, on the birds because the birds are coming earlier and earlier every year and they take more and more of the crop. And if we wait too long, they've taken fifty percent or more of the seeds. That's what they're there to take. So it's not necessarily that. Um, the length of the crop of any of these crops is just based on nutrition or just based on when you can utilize it. I think for what Grant's trying to do, they're just looking for biomass. It doesn't matter if it's a little bit older or a little bit younger. Um, for what we're trying to do, we're trying we're trying to get a healthy crop. So we've had to react to it in different ways, like you know, harvest earlier and dry the seeds. We have a seed dryer now because it's too wet to process. So there's other there's there's a lot of processes that influence this, but over, I, I wanted to share that because overall, um, what occurs to me is that maybe the task force, uh, maybe the consultant's report has too much detail in it because there's still some of that detail that has to be discussed. And so maybe it should be a more general, um, the, ta the, the consultant report should be more general and broad. And you know, one of the big questions you're trying to answer for the legislature is should we invest in a hemp industry? And I think the answer is yes. And I think we could all vote on that right now and say, yes, that would be, you know, a recommendation. But how they invest is going to, I mean, I'm personally not comfortable with saying we're going to give grants to specific companies because I think you're setting it up, the competition that that sets up, you know, like we're going to, we have this money we're going to give for someone to build a processor, you know, or, or a processing center. And we're going to put an RFP out and you can bid on it. What I, what I, I've been pushing for in the biofuel industry, and I think makes more sense is either tax credits for some of the things that you're doing for the production you're doing, or matching grants or something like that, so that everybody can apply if you, you know, if you have the wherewithal to get something done. So 
Um, when I when I look at the recommendations for all these specific RFPs for specific pieces of equipment, I'm a little bit un uncomfortable with that because you're, you're setting some, um, you're setting businesses up to um, be more successful than other ones. That's kind of how I read it. And I what I'd like to see is everybody have the same opportunities um, for success. So, you know, maybe making a general um, recommendation to the legislature, like this is a viable industry. It needs to be supported with state funds. And some ways to do it are, you know, tax credits for uh, hemp production. I like the idea of subsidy for growing hemp. You know, that could be something that everybody could apply for. There's no competition there. Um, and, or, or, you know, or um, uh, some kind of matching funds for, um, for growing and processing um, hemp. So, but but anyway, my idea is that you could you could pare this down a lot if you just make these general recommendations that we can all agree on, and then put a recommendation in the report that says a task force should be convened to um, nail down you know the science of of um, hemp, for instance, and then that conversation could include Grant and the person from UH and people like that, and then a task force to maybe help the legislature to figure out how they're going to subsidize the hemp industry while it works for farmers. Uh, but that way we can continue those discussions later on with the specific people that have the interest in those specific issues and come out with some really concrete ideas, hopefully involving some of the state legislators so they, so they um, feel comfortable with what we're telling them. But um, trying to trying to get us to agree on some of these little detail, you know, there's a lot of detail in here, trying to get us to agree with it in the next week and a half, I think is a is a big ask um, because we're coming at this from a lot of different perspectives. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I would be happy to, you know, move forward and work on a group that's talking about how to, how to shape subsidies, you know, state subsidies, um, because I've been working on that for uh, the biodiesel uh, local production local production tax credit um and and i'm and i'd love to have and i don't necessarily need to be involved in the the science of it because i'm not a scientist and i don't you know understand all the stuff that grant was saying but you know i do know what he some of the stuff he's working on so i would i would just trust the scientists to get together and decide on that and then and then maybe part of your recommendation could also be here are the different sectors here are the different types of products we could produce in our state and how much we're spending on importing those products like fiber, you know, uh, clothing, how much are we spending on importing hemp clothing and how, and if we could replace that with um, local production, that's worth subsidizing. How much are we importing on hemp food? Like this, the hemp, hemp seeds, you know, the things and, and the gummies and the things that they won't let us make in the state and sell, but we can import them from outside the state. All of that stuff should be should be made here if it's economically viable, and then we're keeping all the revenue in our state. We're creating the circular economy, and you know those those kind of general recommendations. I think will at least lead the legislature in the correct direction of saying, "Wow, this industry is really viable." You know, let's move forward. Let's talk about some subsidies. Let's get these different groups together to discuss what would work for them at, in order to grow this industry. So that's kind of my my um, position, and I did want to mention to everybody too that, I don't know if I said this last time, but as a as a county council member on Maui, I did get a position um, in the budget for creating, a, starting to create a local, um, local construction material uh, industry on Maui, which would be, you know, was starting out with hemp and bamboo and could be recycled wood and recycled materials and things like that. Um, which, you know, that was supposed to happen a couple of years ago, and we got the position funded, we got a description, um, and then they hired that person, and then that person was given all kinds of different things to do and never did what they were supposed to do. So, you know, maybe this is something that um, would have needed a task force to say, let's make sure this position does these things so that they don't get taken away by some other shortage in another part of the administration, which is what I think happened. So anyway, that's kind of my input. And if anybody's got any questions, happy to follow up. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, that was very helpful. Um, I know you mentioned Grant a few times. Grant, is there anything you wanted to follow up with um, on Kelly's comments? Otherwise, we can go to someone else that might have their hand raised. 
let's let's give everybody else some time to talk. Thank okay. you. Does anyone else have any other comments? I mean, I have some that I want to share, but obviously other people need to come first. So, uh, anyone else have any comments at this point on the consultant's report and presentation? Okay, then I'm going to um, just run down a, a few thoughts that I, I had um, as I was uh, reading the report. Um, uh, one was kind of following up on what Grant was saying is there seems to be this need to want to divide out cannabinoid hemp and um, and re redefine the federal definition of hemp industrial and cannabinoid. Um, when, you know, we, we're not gonna call it hempcrete hemp, we're not gonna call it seed hemp, and we're not gonna call it biofuel hemp. So, um, and there's a lot of important reasons why we talked about doing that. So I kind of felt like that unilateral re redefining of things to underscore what um, Grant was saying, um, is, is not helpful to the industry because as Robert, I think has said before, many of our, our, many of us who have been cannabinoid farmers did that because that was the only thing you could make money on. There was no other processing, nothing else available. Although all of, many of us have also had other types of plans available. I think I just shared this morning because um, I didn't think it was important in the past, but I just shared with the consultants. We had um, cons uh, investment lined up before COVID for, um, multi-millions of dollars for a fiber project and then in 2020 and then also in 2022 and both of them fell fell through so um i don't think that within the industry there's too much of a cbd versus fiber kind of thing i think that one of the things that's been pointed out is to really understand that you know when we start growing large-scale hemp to be there may be some pollination concerns but overall that that hasn't been a concern on my island although i understand it may be on some um, other islands. Um, the um, the other thing <laughs> that popped out at me was um, there's there's a bit of conjecture in there, and I and I I think that that's one of the things that people are pointing to too is um, you know making conclusions. I know you guys wanted to be data driven, but you made the conclusion that there's a bunch of CBD. Um, hemp growers processing illegally. You know, if you go back and you look at the number of licenses and the people that were growing in 2018, it was much more significant. The acreage was more significant, the numbers were more significant, and we didn't have the processing rules and regulations that we have now. Um, in 2020, the rules passed um, with regard to processing in 2021 is when uh, the, the law passed in 2021 is when the rules came out. And that's when a lot of people put a screeching halt on things because they couldn't figure out how to meet the, the processing requirements. And then by 2023, 2022, people are getting fatigued. I mean, a number of people here on this task force to tell you they haven't planted um, in, in a couple of years because of the regulatory flex, which underscores another problem <laughs> that I'm glad you highlighted in the report and needs to be super highlighted is the impact the regulatory flex has had um, on this industry. And I think that that got reiterated to today by when we went back and reread the email from Bo Whitney, who's the leading hemp um, economist really in the world on cannabis and hemp collects more data than anyone else. And he stated in an um, email to the consultants that he would have easily brought his $230 million um, hemp plastics company here and fiber company here, but he decided against it because of the regulatory flux. And he gave a number of um, in other examples of why that's impacting um, hemp investment. Um, so I'm just going over some of the general themes that I, I so the conjecture um, with regard to um, farmers potentially illegal processing, you have no data on that. You're just making assumptions. So you may be right, you may be wrong, but um, that needs to be pulled. Um, there's no data to verify it. And the other fact of the matter is some people have begun to to buy, I mean, if you look at like most of the like Hawaii products that are on the shelf, they're actually importing um, isolate and stuff from the mainland, which requires, um, and not as of yet, I mean, it, mo most people are ignorant of the fact that they need to do, do anything with regard to labeling or processing. So um, just because uh, there's only four processors in the state doesn't mean there's a bunch of farmers processing things illegally. Um, You know, I, I there is some conjecture too about um, food systems. I mean, most of us also come from a food background um, or, or an agricultural background that involves a lot of different products. And 
um, it's, it is interesting. I was talking to the president of the U.S. Hemp Building um, Association right before this call, and so many of the things we were discussing, he was saying that just doesn't apply to Hawaii. That just doesn't apply to Hawaii because of our scale is so unique, because our climate is so so unique, and and many of the agricultural fixes that we've looked to in the past didn't work well here. And when we go to look at agri certain, uh, you know, I'm not going to be the one that directs agricultural policy or food security policy, but I do know that we're unique. We're unique in our size. We're island states. We're primarily small farms um, that are providing a lot of food in, in the state. And so when we have conjecture and opining in the report about, um, you know, large scale agricultural and it needs to be all mechanized, you know, I'm not against that. I love technology. My background's in civil engineering. But if you also look at some of the reports that have come out from the United Nations on, you know, really what's going to save the planet and in certain situations, what food security is going to be, it's also about smaller generative farms. Um, and of course, there's research that comes out of the mainland U.S. that says something differently. So I just, I'm a little bit wary about making broad, broad stroked um, um, statements about the direction of agriculture in this report when it really should be about what hemp farmers and the industry thinks they need in terms of infrastructure, not necessarily how we're going to grow food or what's going to save Hawaii's um, food industry. So that, those are things that just popped out at me. Um, the other thing was, um, I agree, we need a big plant. What When we get there, how do we get there? I don't know, but I, I We'll continue to emphasize and try. I really appreciate the time you put in trying to find smaller decorticators, but there are options out there um, that are that are quite small, and there are people that are kind of mom and popping it too. So there, um, there we absolutely could set up some small fiber rep operations on the outside islands, which I know in particular. Uh, I had a business plan for <laughs> with regard to animal bedding. I contacted a whole bunch of horse people around the state and, you know, we're, we're all ready to go in some respects. Um, and that there's minimal, such minimal processing um, that's required for that. And you can do it at small scale. And um, there's, there's some unique stuff that's going on in other states where they've actually um, manufactured and built things on farms and all they needed was a little bit of R and D money. So there's, there's, examples out there that we can copy from Kansas, South Dakota, things that people have improvised, but there's also things that people have borrowed from other um, sectors like the cotton gin industry. I guess some old cotton gins are some things that people are using. And then there's also a small micro uh, processor that um, that may work, that, that is so small that individual farms could have. So I, and when you were looking at um, resiliency, in, in industry and economics, it primarily has to do with diversity in numbers. When you put everything into one big anything, that's when you see mass failures in a system, whether it's natural, economic, educational, agricultural. So if I'm talking about trying to build, if, if I'm trying to, <laughs> if I have the magic wand and I'm trying to build a resilient hemp industry, I'm gonna build one that has multiple points of contact, meaning multiple small processors um, around the state. and that does not going to cost much money. I mean, seriously, if we gave out grants of way less than half a, half a million, you know, $100,000, I'm very certain we could get um, a number of folks getting up and running um, either through near food hubs um, or, or through co-ops or even individually businesses, these small processors so we can get some of this decortication going in the, the fiber industry is going. So, um, I appreciate and we need small or a large processor, but we need small processing and, and right away. And that, that I mean, that can happen so much more, that can happen faster and much more nimbly than a very large building <laughs> with, the, with all the things that have to go into a, a large project like that. And I don't think it's either or. I think it's dual track. And I, I but I think that absolutely has to be emphasized in the report. Um, Real quick, the I think this was attributed to me in the report. Sorry, I read it twice, but it's four hundred pages, so I don't have it all cleared in my mind. Um, was the fact that we have said um, many times, and it's clearly documented in in public testimony that we've been um, probably the most um, regulated hemp industry in the state, and that was doubted actually in the report. And you guys said you couldn't find any data that way, so. Um, 
I, I think a number of us here could start start you know start listing off from the very beginning from the, from the passage of you know the modern uh, what we would call in the last fifteen years hemp bills how we were more regulated than any other farmers you know not able to move hemp off our farms. Um, having to test to total THC from the very beginning when no other farmers were required to do that until even one year or two years after the 2018 farm bill. So these guys had, um, you know, up to six years more farmers in other states where they had much more flexibility in terms of the amount of compounds they could have in their crop before, before they failed. But from the very beginning, we had an administrator that was more worried about potential um, litigation and about agricultural production. And so we ended up with rules that were super tight, hamstrung us. We couldn't, we couldn't participate from a production side and, and then it became more difficult from a processing side. So um, we'll give a whole list of examples of how we are hamstrung. But um, when we say that we've been hamstrung, um, we have been. <laughs> and and I'm, I, if we need to get uh, quotes from different folks and reflect back to past past um, past regulations to point out where and how we'll do that. And and buffers is a great example of that. Um, you know, I, I that was a very you know you probably I don't know if someone told you the story and how we even ended up with buffers, but it had to do with one neighbor dispute on Maui. It impacted an entire industry, and this is how significant that impacted this industry. There was a processor on Oahu, state of the art. I toured it in 2019 and 2020 uh, with Greg Smith. And they had invested close to $8 million and we're gonna pump in more. But it they, they, they had to abandon their project, which would have brought another great processor to Oahu. They had to abandon their project um, for two primary reasons. One, the buffers. They had put all this equipment investment in there and there was no way that they could comply with the buffers. And then the second thing was the regulatory flux. They were heavily invested by um, Asian investors and they um, uh, and they just didn't, they just didn't, they thought it was gonna be a money pit, which all of us that have been involved in the hemp industry know it has been a money pit, <laughs> like a yacht. <laughs> so um, there are certainly examples of how the, um, We've operated under really super tough regulations, more difficult than than any other state. It, it certainly for years at a time, and the impact of the regulatory flux on our industry. Um, there's also some a, a number of you know this is getting down in the weeds, kind of like what Kelly was saying. But there's a number of statements in there that um, I think because I verbally downloaded so much to you guys, and I know I speak quickly, it'd probably be difficult. I mean, unless you're recording me to catch it all. But there's, you know, misattributions to Bo Whitney when it should be to Ann Van Slegel, an attorney and Kona coffee farmer. Um, there's just a lot of things in there that make me super, super nervous about having this public, this report public one, because I think it's not necessarily setting us up for resilient hemp industry, but also because of the um, misinformation and mis misattributions, and also because of the conjecture that in some ways makes hemp farmers look bad. And without actual data, I, I think that needs to be pulled. So um, those are my reflections in a nutshell, and I'll just um, leave it at that for now. And I can certainly get more of that in writing to you if that's helpful to you. Um, does anyone else have anything else that they would like to share regarding the... Um, consultant's report or presentation. Yeah. Kelly, I saw your hand go. Well, I was just going to back you up as far as the um, onerous regulations. We actually got the first hemp um, growing permit in the state from the DOA. And I talked to that same person you're referring to in the, in the governor's office who was just spouting some pretty outrageous claims about legal um, liability and stuff that is, I, you know, and I had somebody there from the, from the beginning of the, um, who, the guy who, Mike Bowman, who started the National Hemp Association with me, and he was kind of refuting a lot of what she said, but I just wanted to share, you know, when we are, when we first um, put in our hemp field, which we're not doing anymore, but we were told um, we had to, we had to have it, um, we had to have barbed wire around it. And then they sent us um, 
some kind of a spreadsheet that was asking how many mills the wire wa was and how, how far apart the prongs were. And they, we had to go measure it and make sure. I mean, I showed this to Mike Gabbard and he almost hit the roof. He said, this is ridiculous. And they um, and they wanted us to put a sign up. And we said, we, we purposely put the hemp fields behind our farm shed so that it's not visible from the road because we don't want the theft. Because if we, if we announce to people what we're doing, we'll probably get theft. And they were just really adamant that, and they never could give us a reason why we needed to have a sign. It was like with public safety. I said, well, it's safer for public if they can't even see it. They don't even know it's there. But now you're making us put all this barbed wire around it. That's not very safe for the public. I mean, it was just like those kinds of rules and regulations that it was almost like they were making up, making them up as they went along to make it harder for us to succeed. Because every time we turned around, there was something else that we hadn't done. Um, so I know I just wanted to back up what Gail was saying is that, um, you know, and then when, as we got into it, we realized, well, wait, we can't do edibles, but you could still import edibles. So they're saying, let's support the mainland operations or foreign operations that are making these edibles and we're buying them instead of supporting our local hemp farmers and letting them make these these products. So the, those are some of the um, issues that I think probably should also go into the report is that they there's there wasn't a I, mean, I would like this report to say that there's so much promise in the hemp industry and here's the different sectors that it, it would support and here are the different people making products or could or potentially making products um, because I didn't know Gail was working on fiber but that's I would love to see that happen in an environmentally safe way because it's being done in a horrific way in China um, but just just to to let the legislature know that the research has shown that this is a viable industry, but there are issues with funding. You know, we need some subsidies. Um, we need to agree on the science of uh, what it was that Grant was talking about. Uh, we need to, um, uh, if there's any issues, I mean, I think on our island, there used to be issues with uh, between the industrial hemp, people who wanted to grow up for construction and people who wanted to grow up for um, CBD. So there was that issue. I don't know if it still exists. I'm, I'm happy to hear it doesn't for Gail. Um, but just, you know, th those are the things that need further discussion and further um, and further exploration so that the farmers who are in this industry uh, get can can have their voice heard at that point. So that, that's my thought and how we can move ahead with just, you know, the basic thing is, yes, this is good. This is a good industry. There's a lot of good products we could make. This is this is called the circular economy. This could be a model for the circular economy. Let's move ahead. But here's the here's the challenges that will still exist that we need to work on and get the farmers into these groups to talk about these issues. You know, thank thanks so much, Kelly. That triggered a couple more things I forgot to bring up. Was you're talking about the promise of this industry. Um, you know, it, the introduction. And in the report kind of insinuates that there's not a lot going on. I think that I can understand where that um, assumption comes from. But even in 2020, the hemp, Hawaii Hemp Farmers Association, a group of stakeholders, put out a, um, a survey, monkey, a survey to all the licensed hemp farmers and people in the industry, um, asking them how much they invested to date and how the buffers were putting their their um, investments at risk and was it cash investment was it infrastructure and the, the number back then put in by farmers these are licensees um and a couple of licensees are processors of course right was 15 million dollars so that's not a sneeze and um uh so 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 there's been a lot of activity going on and the other thing that i somehow would like to emphasize is um, when we say things, um, you know, we didn't always provide the data. I guess we assumed that our word would be good enough, but I can understand you need to back that up. But if you go onto the public record, we've provided so many experts over the years to back us up on statements. Very little of what we say is just pulled out of thin air. Um, so it's um, we've tried to be as professional as we can be. And I think we've, I think we've succeeded because as Kelly has alluded to, you know, we have relationships um, really around the country and around the world, which have helped inform what we're doing. And that's why we know we're, li we're living in crazy land of hemp land here. <laughs> the things kind of got a little pushed sideways. The last thing I'd like to say, it goes back to Kelly's thing on how much promise there is, is 
the the low hanging fruit and i really would like the introduction to be a lot more optimistic because you know you want someone to buy into an industry or to really see what's already been done you don't start out with saying there's no industry um first of all that that's not that's not true because we have a, a, an existing you know we cbd market as we know at 52 million dollars somewhere in the introduction that should be in there that if all we did was a marketing campaign and to build the, the CBD farmers who are also fiber farmers who are also microgreen farmers, their, their capacity to participate in that market more, marketing, a little bit of processing help, we could move the dial in agriculture. I was talking to uh, Senator Tim Richards, the chair of the um, vice chair of the Senate Ag Committee last week. And he's like, I'm trying to move the ag um sector in the state in $15 million chunks. My goodness, you know, I'm sure that that number at $52 million for CBD was back in 2020, I think when Bo calculated that, maybe it was 2019. We know it's bigger than that now. We've got at least probably three, maybe four $15 million chunks there. If we did the heavy duty marketing and created that circular economy that we've all talked about that we wanted and redirected that money that's being exported in state, that is such low, low hanging fruit. It's such low hanging fruit that we could then bring some more money back into the state. And in no way is it either or with the fiber industry. I mean, it, all these things can go forward and these recommendations can happen at the same time because a marketing campaign, you know, let's say you let a grant for 10 grand to a nonprofit, you know, they can get a lot of PSAs for free. A, a little bit of money is going to go a long way. So I, I really would like to see emphasized more up front in the report that the, the huge opportunity with this ex existing CBD market and all the money it's being spent, that huge opportunity there is to uplift agriculture and farmers um, in the state. And of course, we've talked about how that ties back to food security because a lot of us CBD farmers <laughs> need the margins to offset our hobby for growing food for free or to the loss. <laughs> so, so Gail, what, what you said about the marketing too, you know, and this could maybe go into a recommendation is every island has an EDB, an economic development board. And that's their job is to help diversify and grow the economy. So maybe, and they all get well, ours gets county money. I think they all get state some state money. And so maybe one of the recommendations is that should be part of their job is growing this industry and helping with marketing, um, bringing the farmers together on their island and, and figuring out what, what kind of uh, equipment they need and um, how they can work together to um, share ideas. So those, those um, EDBs are not used as much as they could or should be because they're, they're, they are private nonprofits, but they do get a lot of funding from county and state money. So that would be one way to kind of, you know, direct um, how this industry could get help, the different sectors could get help with the marketing. Yeah, that's great. Great idea. Are there more immediate thoughts um, about the report? I think, I think what the discussion so far has showed us that we, there's a, a quite a bit that needs to be amended in the report from our perspective, and um, a lot can be pulled out. Um, I th I think a lot in there that the legislature might have to go through. Thank you, Scotty. I see a hand. Yeah, oh, hi. Hey, hello. Just finished my two bags of popcorn watching all this action happen today. Um, and I do want to say that um, I, I think the report for me, because I could probably never even scratch the surface of writing a report that they did. Really appreciative of Shar and 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 um, uh, Megan. And also I think the key thing with today's discussion and the follow on discussions is exactly what everybody contributed to today uh, while they had their, their opportunity to speak is make sure we get all of this in bullet point form to the, to the, uh, um, consultant so they can make the changes or, you know, uh, detract or add, you know, the scientific uh, stuff and, and whatnot. Uh, but, but the main thing I want to see was, uh, is, is that hopefully we'll vote on this before August 30th and not extend this task force. Because if we do, we'll probably miss our, our opportunity to get before the ledge. And the thing is, is what everybody's talking about, and I've, I've got an opportunity to talk to 
maybe 30 hemp people or specialists around the world from China to Canada to to Kansas and, and wherever. Uh, everybody has a different form of, of, of doing their operations, what operations they are doing with hemp and how they do it, when they harvest it, what digester they use or they don't use it. There's so many different forms, but I think with this general uh, uh, report that's going to be handed in, it's, it's going to be a start for us to just get all of your guys' inputs in there with these consultants and, and get it in. Um, you know, and and the thing is, is don't get too hung up on people's different individual company operations and, and ways they do things with what experts they use or don't use. Because my operations are mostly completely different from everyone else's that has spoke today. Um, so if you're putting your guys' operations into this report, it's definitely not going to affect me or help me. Um, but I would like to see the grants. I would like to see funding at, at big facilities, multiple small facilities. And I said it very, very early on when requesting funding from the state, um, whether it's on a nonprofit side or a for-profit side, let us apply for it. Everyone gets a fair shot at it because my machines may not be the same as your machines. But if the state is going to do something like the value added station that they're, they're doing in Wahiwa, I see where they're going with that. They got 20, 30 different companies going there and using the machines that the state bought and it fits these guys' operations. But it doesn't fit mine, so I don't go there. But I, I like it. But they, they put money towards it and it's a start. So just to cap off, get all your bullet points in for the changes these consultants can make. Let's meet a couple more times. Let's vote on the final thing. Let's get this in by the 30th so we can move on. And uh, oh, lastly, if you guys want to submit your own testimony, by all means, let the task force do this one with the consultants. The Hemp Association of Hawaii can always put in their own. Somebody can go individually, can go as a company, an organization, or an individual when the hearing happens. And then that way, everybody will be heard and we don't get all tied down with just trying to manipulate one report, you know. Go and put in multiple reports. I'm sure the legislators would love to hear that um, all together as one coalition. Anyway, that's all I want to say. Thank you. You know, I, I agree with you, Scotty. It's always more effective when we speak with one voice. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why we want to get it right, because one of the things that we've seen bite us is even an incorrect preposition <laughs> you know, in a role. So um, I think we're a little bit nervous about, um, at least I can speak for myself that way. If I hear you, you wanna get it done. No, and, that, and that's good because I've been learning all different types of terminology, which is good. And um, yeah, we definitely gotta get the terminology and the, the history down in there and everything ready. And that's why I think the consultants are taking notes. Uh, we just got to get it to them so they can do their job. Yeah, and and to speak to your point of getting bullet points in, um, none none of us are paid to do this, and I'm hopeful these guys have been taking notes on what we have said, and maybe if other things come up because um, I, yeah, I don't know who has time to do that, but hopefully. Um, yeah, I understand. I, I I'm a business owner, so nobody yeah. pays for anything I do unless I sell something. Yeah, and, there you uh, go. Yeah, I've been. Hemp, yeah. <laughs> I was actually out at that facility at um, Vahiva last um, last Saturday. Pretty nice. Um, yeah. Uh, Mr. Matsuda, your hand is up. Thank you. Hello. Oh, yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. Um, sorry to make comments earlier, but um, I don't know if it's too late. But no. you know, uh, it'd be good to have something that would help for funding, you know, like Scotty knows, you know, I'm always, I'm always, you know, raising money and my background is investment banking. So if, you know, things that the legislation can do or the state could do to promote that, like the banking industry, the insurance industry and the property, you know, the property owners, for them to say that, well, you know, we, we can't support you because you do hemp. You know, even to this day, it's still a problem. You know, so like, you know, just last week I tried to expand 
my um, my uh, nursery, you know, where I grow um, where I grow uh, clones. And the landlord found out and said, all of a sudden, no, we're not going to let that in there. Um, banking industry is a problem moving money in and out um, into Hawaii because a lot of banks, when they ask you what is the money for, is well, you know, we're we're going to buy hemp seeds to grow you know, CBD, and they're like, oh, they won't, you know. Bank of Hawaii still is against it. And there's one bank that does promote it, but their minimum banking fees a month is like $7,000 just to have the account, which, you know, it's, mm-hmm. and it's the only one that you can say openly you're doing it. And then the insurance companies like, you know, Island Insurance who kind of indirectly invested into the marijuana business doesn't actually provide insurance for the hemp business. So, you know, so these things, cause problems for investing to, to get funding because a lot of the people you know i go to our institutions or professionals so they have they have issues on their own like if, if if there's a banking problem their internal controls would stop it so it really shrinks down the amount of people i can go to to raise capital and it also really shrinks down the amount of money i can move it out at a given time into hawaii to do these businesses. Um, so, so, and you know, in the past I've, I've done, you know, uh, a processing plant that we could do a hundred pounds an hour. Um, one thing I would say about it is, um, you know, the state has to do something to stop the outside products coming in. Cause the, the, the number one problem we had was trying to find buyers for our end product. You know, we, we had like, I mean, one time 30,000 pounds of biomass that we processed into distillate. And basically, we ended up throwing it away, you know, disposing of it because we couldn't find uh, the customer base there. Um, so my only comment is if there could be a section about how the, the state could promote or, or put together some way that, you know, the insurance industry, the banking industry, cannot like I mean should not um, support us by saying you know we can't we can't give you that bank account or we can't we can't allow that you know that hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars trans you know transfer into your account because it's for him you know, and this money comes from Japan which is also very um, strict but I'm able to get it out of Japan but I'm not able to get you know depending on the bank I'm not able to get it in. And sometimes it causes a lot of delay. And that's not good when you, you know, you're growing something, you need the money, you need the money. You know, three weeks later, it's too late already. <laughs> and, you know, paying the insurance companies here that provide insurance, they should also provide insurance for hemp businesses. Instead of us trying to scramble around the mainland, you know, like one of the biggest things is I have to scramble every time to find insurance for like general liability products because the local insurance companies don't provide it. Uh, and that is that causes problems with my investors because you know, how do you prove you can sell something if you can't even insure it? That's my only comment. To help funding, that's the biggest issues I deal with with trying to raise money. Yeah, that yeah. is so spot on. Um, it speaks to, <laughs> It speaks to why we were so concerned about the recreational marijuana bill last year. Because despite the assurances that we might not lose our banking or or ins- insurance, we knew from talking directly to other farmers in other states when they were when the CBD hemp was combined under a cannabis authority with recreation or medical marijuana, a lot of farmers lost their insurance and banking. And just like you said, who can afford marijuana bank accounts of three thousand dollars to seven thousand dollars a month? Mine's free, you know, right now. And then, um, of course, I lost my insurance due to that because Lloyd's of London pulled out altogether um, from because of this reason. And I didn't even know that's why I lost my insurance a couple of years ago. Um, so, you know, if the state is even thinking about, and I pray they're not trying to smash us under the um, hemp, any form of hemp with um, marijuana. They need to seriously address upfront these banking and insurance issues because they're bad right now. But if we start losing it in the future, that just completely undermines all the industry. And in these states where that's happened, 
it's not just the CBD hemp growers that lose their banking or insurance. It's also hemp and fiber guys. So um, thank you for bringing that point up. And we've got more hands up. Yay, um, Rusty, thanks for joining in. Um, thanks. And uh, my name is Rusty Taff from Conline Adventures. I appreciate um, Michelle Michele. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name, but those were those were um, pertinent comments um, in terms of barriers to fundraising and um, which certainly impact the growth of the industry. And I also like how, um, you know, that fundraising in industry when it's viable is not actually very difficult to do. There's a lot of private money um, in the world that is looking for a great business opportunity. So when when it actually pencils out, I'm sure that, um, you know, investment capital will arrive. Uh, and a lot of the limitations on the, um, you know, the vi economic viability of these businesses relates to regulations. Um, and uh, to add to that, um, crop insurance is available through the federal government. Um, I was able to obtain it at one point while planning to um, grow. Uh, but again, those plans have been sidelined due to the regulatory flux. Uh, but so there's some crop insurance available. I don't, that doesn't relate to um, the products and the product manufacturing and all that downstream, but thanks for the comment. That's all. Thanks, Rusty. Um, Brittany, and then um, we'll probably need to uh, move on to our other agenda item because June, correct me, if, make sure I'm not wrong about this. We have the opportunity to continue the discussion of the consultant's report at the next, correct? correct? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Let's go. So, mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead, Brittany, thanks. Um, thank you. I just basically wanted to um, just agree with what Michele um, had mentioned. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, and just make it very clear that across the board, it's really, really important that the hemp industry stays very uh, separated from anything related to medical cannabis or recreational cannabis, even down to, um, you know, any agencies that are commingling funds for registering as processors, et cetera, that, that it's very, very separated because otherwise it can have a devastating impact on our ability um, to bank and whatnot, uh, which we're already having challenges with. So thank you. Thanks, Brittany. Uh, Michele, Mr. Matsuda, did you have another um, something else you wanted to add? Oh, yeah, yeah. So everybody's pronouncing my name correctly. It's Michele. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, surprisingly, you know, it's the first time it happened, I think. <laughs> but um, yeah. on the uh, on the, um, the the from the fundraising point of view, you know, just commenting on the on the report, the extraction system. It will be, you know, if, if this actually does get through, it would be important to make sure that whoever is the operator is, is bankable. Um, like I, I have no, I have no problems raising money. Uh, it's just that for this one industry in Hawaii, because of the banking restrictions, insurance restrictions, it makes it difficult to get money in and out and to justify why. Um, the business is viable, um, but spun, just kind of comment directly on the agreement. I mean, on the report is whoever's the operator needs to be. I think one of the criteria needs to be they have to be bankable. If that would be then we would be able to use it. Otherwise, we would just like right now we're building our own now. We're we took apart our old system, sold it all off, and now we're shrinking everything down because the market is not big enough to support. You know, a system that does a hundred pounds a minute, I mean, an hour, you know, to process CBD. Um, but anyway, that, that's my only comment. As long as everything's bankable, then I, it would make things easy for me to raise money. And if the other regulations went away, or the state was more proactive in, you know, making it easier to raise, to bring money in. Thank you. Those are all really great points. So, um, Gabe, um, I just want to, I, that, you know, I noticed that Char's had her hand up for a while, so. Oh, sorry, Char. 
<laughs> Jump in. <laughs> I hope I can. I've tried to make notes on what I should talk about. There's a lot. So first, I certainly believe with I agree with Brittany. We never intended for the report to be that long. We we're just responding to the outline we were given. We had to answer all of those questions. Not they weren't in any particular order. One of the sections was like 50 pages long, and one was one page long. So it's yeah. And the other thing is Robert. Um, two things. One, the I have been talking about no-till drills with. Uh, first products in Georgia for over a year and I will send you the emails and I did forget to give it to Megan to put in the addendum. So I'll get her that information. It's an amazing product. So I know there are many out there, but this is a particularly nice one. So um, and for Kelly, we, we intend, I think, first of all, Kelly, I think you wrote, read the old report and what happened last week, we had a meeting, we all agreed that we'd have 24 hours to Beef up our report and then send it out. And June sent it out at at five twenty one that very afternoon. I think a lot of you read that. And that's the problem because you got to read the next one. And I'm afraid that was a confusing thing. And secondly, Robert, it, the, it was not been the consultants that have pushed this task force around at all. We've all been pushed around by the Department of Ag, and so they've been leading this thing and saying you got to talk about this and this and this and this and this today. It, it wasn't our agenda at all. So what else? Um, we will certainly take out all of the negative things that you've all mentioned. No problem with that. We don't want to diminish the cannabis industry. Um, the, yeah, the decorticator thing, I spoke again to Randy White for an hour on Monday, and I said, Randy is the head of formation ag he knows all of the industry everybody making anything i said do you know of anybody who's making a medium sized decorticator and he said no but if you guys can find it i am so happy to look into it yeah I, don't I eliminate be, it from the report just because you couldn't find uh, it I got like eight numbers today yeah thank you okay if you find them great i mean i've seen some on the internet that's like they've kind of put something together in the backyard well, in formation ags in, in lawsuits over some of their stuff, so they might not always be the best. But yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, they're mid sized decorticator. Yeah, that's another story. Okay. Um, okay, just please, and particularly, uh, Mikkel, if you would send us what you just said, that would be so wonderful to put exactly what you said in the report. Very solidifying for everybody. Anybody who's got comments, please send them. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and sounds like you've captured, and, and this will be a recording too, so you guys can go back and capture the comments as well. Like that, that'd, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, I just want to make sure I got the right report. This is the second one, right? The updated one. Yeah, yeah the updated one. Okay, yeah sent out last Thursday. Yeah, okay, thank you. I don't know that we're done discussing the report because June, I'm not sure how to, these these agenda items really overlap. Um, you know, there's- uh, Gail, so we have, um, we have put this agenda in case uh, we need, you know, to tackle this, but since we haven't, you know, had the consensus regarding the findings and recommendations of the um, consultant, so we can still continue that next Friday, the following Monday, uh, 23rd, 26th, 28th, so those are already, you know, finalized. And we are still looking for the 29th and the 30th uh, of August. So I think, Gail, if you want to, uh, you know, um, uh, continue the second agenda only, that, that that's fine because we still have a lot of time to talk for the next agenda. Uh, the next agenda I actually um, um, uh, is connected to the first agenda. So it's hard to talk about the, 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 the third agenda if you haven't had any consensus regarding, you know, what to do with the findings or the recommendations of the consultant. So yeah, I, 
there is no consensus at all for sure and until we see changes it's it's hard to know um Thank, thank you, June, for clarifying that. So maybe we'll just continue on with this agenda item since they all are all related. Um, Grant, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Gail. Um, just a brief suggestion here. Uh, I think for time purposes, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are very busy with personal businesses outside of this and on hemp as well. Uh, for myself, at least making these meetings has been incredibly difficult due to standing ones like on go. Um, I would suggest if it is possible and legal under Sunshine Law, that we create some type of asynchronous commenting document that the public and anyone on this task force can access. This can easily be set up with Google Docs, uh, but it would allow people to comment here if they're available to do it. But I just don't think we're going to possibly get through the volume of things people have to say. And I don't think it's actually prudent to just be sending it directly to Shar and Megan. I think these are ideas that other folks should probably benefit from having an understanding on. So. If there's comment on the legality behind that, that's my singular concern. Um, but I do think asynchronous document would be very helpful for this purpose. So I would kick that over to our um, assistant uh, AG. Our um, deputy attorney general is here at Travis Moon. So Travis, can you? So we're Andrea? wondering. Yeah, Grant's question is whether we could have an, uh, a document online that members of the public and the task force could comment on, and it, it would be helpful to not just the task force, but anyone out there who might want to learn along with us. Travis, you're muted. Um, Travis, you're muted. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I don't think that's feasible under Sunshine Law because it would require um, to be open to the public. And typically these Google Share Docs are specific to each email address. So I don't know how that would be possible. So uh, if I can chime in here, you can make a public access link that anyone can go to and edit on. It's not specific to email address. You just make it open access to anyone. So this is commonly done for Oh, an assortment of things from companies to you know, nonprofits to people planning a bake sale. Mm -hmm. um, it, so I don't know if that link can get put out, but it, it certainly can be made so that if you simply circulate it, you can go to that URL and access it. Yeah, I, I would think that the uh, that link would be put on the agenda. So I guess I don't know if what's the next agenda, June? that needs to be posted? It's the um, discussion and decision-making on the task force findings and recommendations, including any proposed legislation. To no, be no, excuse, excuse me, like which date? Because uh, I know that you posted agendas for Friday. Like what agendas still need to be posted? 29th and 30th, if we stick to that rigorous schedule, which is a discussion in and of itself we need to have real quick. Okay. Well, it would need to be properly noticed. So that link would have to be provided on the agenda if it's gonna be discussed at a meeting. So for the purposes of the next meetings, I mean, it, it might not work. Okay, that's fair. Okay, do Maybe you publicly notice it right now? No. He's saying that right. we'd, have to be, we'd have to put it on the agenda even to decide whether we wanna put a link up, which is this, same answer I got back from um, Andrew on having subgroups was that we would have to agendaize it to even discuss it and appoint them. That puts us out basically at the 29th, 30th. So, so right. So if you want to create this shared Google Google document open to the public, it would need to be put, that link would need to be put on the agenda and only, can only be discussed at that meeting, right? Understood. So I don't know if it Thank defeats you, the purpose. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I'd like to get back to, um, well, well, two things. One, I think there's an assumption here we're operating under that I don't know it's viable. And I'd like some input from the task force on that. And that is that, first of all, not, all of us are business people and farmers. I, I don't know how I can find time for these meetings. I mean, really it's, but the bottom line is this report is so important to our industry. We've already seen how misinformation can sideswipe us for years at a time. So that's why I think so many of us feel it's important to get this get this right. 
um, and to be more concise about it. So the, the assumption we're operating under is that we have to be done August 30th. But the fact of the matter is we weren't done with report July 7th. And that's not blaming anyone. We're all Department of Ag, Task Force, the consultants, we're all doing the best we can. And it's so nice to have these discussions. Um, but we're operating under assumption that something bad's going to happen, where my understanding is we government missed dates, committees missed dates, no one's going to get fired, especially if we stand up and cheer for Department of Ag and Department of Health and say, thank you for allowing us to take some more time to discuss this, to get this right. Because I don't know that I, and I'll throw this out there, maybe I'm wrong, that all of us can make the next few um, meetings to make sure that the report has in it what it needs to have. So um, so I'd like the sum, that we're operating an assumption that August 30th is really drop dead when July 1st wasn't drop dead and many other dates aren't drop dead in government. I used to work in government for eight years. Um, and the other thing is we have a motion on the floor or Robert wanted to put a motion forward. So before we break up, we definitely need to revisit that motion and discuss it quickly. So, um, yeah, well, I, can, I can address your first point. Um, so by statute, the, the uh, task force is set to dissolve at the end of the month. So any business that happens after August 30th is not an official act of the task force. So I do implore you guys to come to a list of recommendations um, prior to that date so you can submit something to the legislature. If we can't do a Google document, do you have advice on how we could draft could the chair draft and get input from the task force? Because I don't, as a farmer, there's so much problems and the HDOA was correct to not accept this draft report. And this draft report just being public makes a lot of problems. So um, is there any way that we can write this report because according to the statute they were supposed to have it by 7-1 that would give us two months and you say we can't use the shared document it's uh it's very difficult for us to all write write our task force within such a limited time frame okay let me clarify about the google doc robert you could use a Google Doc, but you can't discuss it unless it's agendized on um, an agenda. Um, the other thing is, sorry, what was your other question? I'm sorry. <laughs> is if that's the case, can't someone just create a Google Doc document right now and then? Oh, I'm sorry. Right. So I get. Mm -hmm, sorry. Yeah, I guess you could individually email someone to compile all of your comments. That's how, that's, that's one way around. Um, I guess not around, but it, it's not a violation of Sunshine Law. If each individual members that have comments sends it to one person to compile it. That sounds good. So we could all email the chair and they could kind of, um, bring it up in the next task force meeting and we could talk about it in public or how about if we just email it to the the consultants so that they could go ahead and put it in the report i don't trust the consultants report i don't want it being public there's so much inaccuracies and problems with this report the hdoa was correct not to accept it it should have been here by seven one and not being uh by seven one is crunching us. Um, you know, so, Gail has to be the recipient of all that because then you have to compile it all. But I would, I mean, I, I, I would suggest that maybe as the chair, um, you could write a letter to the legislature telling them that we just don't have enough time uh, to go through all the detail and maybe even throw in there a recommendation that yes, they support this industry, but give us more time to get into the details of how, um, and that could come from the chair uh, so that we have a voice at the legislature and they understand that as volunteers, I mean, I don't, I don't have time to meet every day next week, even if we could notice it. And I don't think anybody here wants to, so, um, but I, I, 
I mean, the main message I think that we want to send to the legislature and our consultants want to send to the legislature is, yes, this is a viable industry that should be supported by the state. And there's a lot more detail that has to be worked out. That's basically, I think, um, a, a strong message that, uh, you know, we have farmers who are who are part of these different sectors of the hemp industry and uh, they're struggling. You know, we we stopped farming hemp because of all the struggles and but I still want to see it happen because, you know, I think it's it will help our um, affordable housing industry and um, maybe affordable clothing and things like that. So I you know, as a I mean, I'm happy to sit on the sidelines and cheer anybody who can make it. But I think we do need support from the state and we need to make that point at least. So you're suggesting, Kelly, that the task force author a letter. Um, we don't accept the report or state that um our our concerns about it and um we just keep moving forward with meeting informally potentially um well um yeah there wouldn't be any there wouldn't be any support for it from the state you know and i i get what travis is saying but um you know i i just the two things that that letter would accomplish is one making a statement to the state legislature that those of us on the task force see this as a viable industry that needs support at, from the state and county levels and you know it, it's got a lot to offer as far as um, the circular economy and then the two is just that we don't have enough time to dig into all the details in the draft report to um, feel comfortable that this this is representative of this task force uh, and we can't do that by August 30th or whatever the deadline is so um and okay. I, I, don't know if it, it, I think it was Mike Gabbard that wrote the bill. So maybe sending that to the chair of the Ag Committee. Uh, and letting him know that and, and asking him for his advice. You know, what do you suggest we do, Mike? My guess is he'll defer to what we want to do. I have a quick question for the AG. And then I know Brittany has her hand up. Um, Travis, is if... Um, if Kelly were to draft the letter and we were to discuss it or next week, um, does that could, since this is part of the discussion with regard to the consultant report and there are recommendations as a task force, we could then talk about that letter, correct? At the next meeting. I think it has to be put on the agenda. Then you can talk. You can talk about whatever you put on the agenda with the six days notice. Well, okay. you know, okay. So this would be legal advice. So I don't know if you want me to give legal advice in open session. Um, Gail, I don't personally because have a I mean we could go into executive session, but there's only three minutes left in the meeting. Well, yeah, we need to hear the motion that was on the floor quite a while ago. So um, can you can, concisely tell us what you think is, yeah. I mean, unless someone else is opposed to hearing this. So, I mean, to me, the letter would be related to your final report. So I don't see how it wouldn't be related to that agenda item about discussion about recommendations and the final report yeah that's what i was thinking too okay all right so it would be okay to discuss at the next meeting thanks um Brittany, you had your hand up thank you um i just had a question regarding um you know if if individual comments are able to be sent to the chair for example to compile them um would it be allowable under the sunshine law for somebody to be able to assist the chair in that? Because I know everybody's very busy and um, if it is allowable, I'd like to volunteer to help Gail with that, just to take a little bit of something off your plate. But again, just wanting to make sure that we're following sunshine law. So any uh, input you have on that, please, um, it would be very helpful. Yeah, I think under Sunshine Law, that would be okay, as long as only one person is collecting the information from all the members. The, the rule is that you can't have, you can have two. two members of the board discuss with each other, but you can't have serial communications. So 
Brittany, if you're going to assist Gail, you can't have conversations or emails about the rec the list of recommendations with anyone else, only with Gail. That's, that's kind of the gist of it. Yeah. So you could assist her with compiling it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that offer. If we go that route, thanks, Brittany. Um, I know we're running out of time, but a long time ago or at the very beginning, um, Robert, do you want to restate your motion that you had made so we can get back to it? I know Brittany had seconded it, but we didn't get to it. And um, maybe it can wait for next meeting, but can you go ahead and share it again? I think Brittany made the motion, but I agree with the motion because the H2A was right not to accept the task force consultants report. And I know it's a lot of work, but the way that the AG just mentioned with us emailing you uh, and then we all, uh, help anyone that's willing to help. And then the report coming from the farmers because there's so much inaccuracies with the consultant's report that it'd be easier just to take what is good from that report and put our own report and kind of get this consultant report off of the public because the HUA was right not to accept it. It wasn't by the deadline. It It's so much inaccuracies that it's easier just to make a more concise report to the legislature. So um, it's not as uh, concise as the motion Brittany made, but pretty much that we don't accept the consultant's report and use their recommendations to write the task force report. Brittany, do you want to elaborate? I, I may have gotten it backwards in terms of who made what motion and who seconded. Sure. Um, I think I did originally bring the motion, but I'm I'm fine bringing it or seconding it either way. But essentially, um, the motion was to have the task force uh, generate and submit our own final report um, rather than the, to have the consultants submit the report on our behalf. Um, um, Gail, again, I think um, um, Attorney General um, Andrew Goff already mentioned this before, that the task force, I'm just reinforcing what he mentioned in the last few meetings, that the, that the consultant's report doesn't really um, affect the task force, uh, the Hawaii Ham Task Force final report. So you I you need to either vote for it, refuse it, accept it, or amend it. That is his words. So right now, I think for the first agenda, we are still on the first agenda. We haven't moved on. So we are still trying to find a consensus on what are you going to do with the, 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 the findings and the recommendations. So I just want to make, uh, clear that up because we've been talking about this and I believe that it's better to, you know, um, um, we find a resolution for the findings and recommendations first, whether you approve all of this, you refuse this one, or you want to amend as what uh, Scotty Wong mentioned, put in a, you know, in a um, bullet points to be, um, to be voted upon by the task force members. So to be clear then, there are two, potentially two reports. There's a consultant report that we have the opportunity to influence, but that's going in one way or the other, but the, cons but the task force has the authority to, to determine whether we like it or not, or whether we accept it, or, and we can influence the report. And we can also have our own separate small report or a letter saying, how we feel about 
our time on the task force, and then also the findings of the consultant reports. There's two products that would be. Uh, and if that is what the task force wishes to, so you have you have to vote on that too. I believe Andrew was saying that it's the task force report that is the report, and the consultants are just giving their report to the task force. So we can vote to refuse the task force consultants report. I guess my question would be if we vote to refuse it, that doesn't make it go away. I mean, I mean, what what if for some reason the ta say the task force refuses it, what happens then, Jim? So or the maybe, task Travis, <laughs> both of you. So uh, I if the task force refuses to to um, uh, accept the recommendations from the consultant, so the task force can either make their own recommendations or get some of the recommendations from the task that the consultant itself that you think might work, as has been um, um, mentioned by Kelly, because. There are things here, I think, in the task force, uh, the consultant's uh, report that might work as a start. So actually, we're looking for something that we can move for, uh, forward to the legislatures. So if you believe that there is really no, nothing to get from the task force, uh, from the consultant's report, then you may want to write your own report to be sent to the legislature. I think Travis can correct me if I'm wrong with that uh, statement. No, you're not wrong. Oh. So uh, Robert, I, um, yeah, I'll make some comments after you, Robert, go ahead. I um, was just agreeing with what Andrew said. That was my understanding that even if we refuse the Task Force uh, Consultants Report, we can still use anything that we think is good to make our more concise report. And then I believe that that would make the Consultants Report kind of be able to go away because the HGOA didn't accept it and then we don't accept it, but we can still use what is good from it to make our more concise um, farmer-driven report to the legislature. So I guess I would have maybe a question to the consultants because, you know, there were a lot of comments today that are super important to us. I mean, one of them, one of them I know being that you guys have redefined hemp, um, you think it's going to change on the national scene. It may or may not, but none of us here <laughs> like that. Um, the, um, the, the other thing is, you know, there, there's been this tone that um, CBD is somehow holding back the rest of the industry, which isn't really true. Um, it's regulatory flux has held back all sectors of the hemp industry. So, you know, you've, you've heard some overarching themes here where there may be fundamental disagreements between us, or maybe not after you've heard like, you know, our struggles historically with the regulations and whatnot. Um, so I guess my question to the consultants is, um, can you take what we've said verbally here and, and, and change the report? Because I guess if you can't, then it puts us in a really tough place because you're putting something forward that impacts our livelihood in the future and a strategy of moving hemp forward that differs than what the industry says. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are at this point. I just think there's so much feedback. And if you guys think that we had so many inaccuracies in the report, then and our what we thought going into this was that we submit the report and then you guys agree or disagree and you're submitting your own separate report based off of what we submit. That's what we understood that that was going to happen anyway. Um, but there's so many different feedback, you know, hearing Rob say that the DOA hasn't accepted it like 15 times. I don't even know what that means. But to say that there's so many inaccuracies in there, I would suggest that you guys take our report and take out all the inaccuracies. Like if if we did such a horrible job, then 
you guys put in what you think because this is your task force. We were hired to bring this information to light and to put our opinions and like the data that supported all of that. And like I said, industrial hemp, it's, it's proposed in the new farm bill. And we do think that will help with regulate. Like I keep hearing regulatory flux, but on the industrial hemp side, I still don't understand what Bo Whitney was up against when he was trying to open a fiber plastic operation here. It's still not clear to me. Um, so if you guys have clarity on these things and you guys have your recommendations that you want in there, then I would say, take what you want from our report, delete everything else that you think is inaccurate or is extraneous and put together your concise report. You can copy and paste because we put a lot of time and effort into this and I understand that we're down to the deadline right now and I don't think that's fair either. But I also don't think it's fair to keep saying that everything's inaccurate and everything is wrong and we don't know anything. And because to be honest, I don't know why anyone else didn't answer this RFP. If everyone put this in the bill, you were all a part of putting it together. Why didn't Bo Whitney answer this? Why didn't you answer this, Gail? Like, so I'm just being defensive. I'm going to answer that right now, and I'm going to interrupt you because you're making some accusations here. All right, this is not the way this should be going. All right, we're supposed to be collaborating here together. Okay. Okay. So, and you just so told us our whole report is inaccurate. You, Everything's inaccurate. So please send us what's inaccurate. I, we Gail, need it to be concise. Can you? Can I have a suggestion first? Um, is the task force um, uh, wishes to vote for this uh, inaccuracies to be put by the consultants to uh, to correct this in the report? You may, you know, you may vote for it. Well, I, that's what I was trying to gauge was uh, what I'm hearing is different than what I thought. I mean, I, I heard at the beginning of the meeting, like an invitation for feedback and All an right. invitation for, um, you know, data that we've provided um, and, you um, I guess, um, Megan, I'm a little bit concerned that, that when I when we use the term regulatory flux, that that doesn't mean anything yet. And when Bo says that, it doesn't mean anything. So just real quick, that means when the rules and the when we're every year in the legislature with proposed hemp legislation to change something, even though it looks minor, that scares investors. We haven't had a year since 2014 where we haven't had some kind of change going on. That's 10 years of flux. So, I understand, but on the fiber side, what's specifically on the, on the fiber, fiber side? side? Megan and Gail, excuse me, if I may inter if I may interject, I think Brittany has a motion on the floor. True, and thank you. We, we are, you know, we're over time. So why don't we proceed with Brittany's motion if there's a second, and then we can adjourn and discuss at the next meeting. I already seconded that motion to refuse the report. I guess I, I was asking for discussion because my vote will depend on how willing I think the consultants are to hear us and whether we did get heard. And I'm I'm concerned at this point. Please go ahead, Char. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. I was trying to say that <clears throat> I'm totally willing to take out everything that you've mentioned, everything I've heard, put in anything that you send me. But please understand that our we have a formatting nightmare because we've used both Google Docs and and Word and nothing is lining up so it may not look that pretty but i will definitely do whatever i can to edit the thing so that that part is fine but please send your recommendations like what we got this morning is perfect we need more of that and what you sent as well gail so and if Brittany's willing to help that would be wonderful so i can say that personally yeah grant go ahead i'll do that Thank you. Um, for the I'd like to just cast a vote in favor of Brittany's motion as well. I, I do have to jump off everyone. And I appreciate the work Megan and Sherry guys have done, but I don't think this reflects what the outcome the task force needs to put forward. So I would encourage us to draft another report. And again, I'm in support of the motion. So thank you all today. Have a great rest of your day. Okay, so wait, Grant, don't get off yet because I don't know if we haven't taken an official vote yet. Um, okay. <laughs> is, there any more, is there any more discussion? Other, otherwise, I'll call for the vote and then, then your, your vote can be um, registered the way you want it to be registered. Is there any more discussion on this? Okay, then I'll call for a vote on the motion. Those um, in favor of rejecting the report at this time, um, I guess, raise your hands physically, verbally. And do we need to do a roll call, June? Aye. Okay, 
So we've got yeah, hi. This, okay, we've got Jared there. Okay, so Charlene, Robert, Grant, Trusty, Brittany. Um, I see. I don't know what Kelly, Greg, Kyle, um, or Michaela are doing. Are you guys this is Kyle. Hi. So you're voting I to reject. Okay. Kyle's voting This I. is Greg. This yeah. is Greg Smith. Uh, I. I. Okay. Um, Kelly, are you still on the line? <laughs> She's probably multitasking like we all do on Zooms at times. Um, Michaela, do you have a, um, a, which way are you voting on this motion? Against. Against. Okay. I don't right. agree. Okay, thank you. So we've got um, one abstention, Kelly, and then um, one opposed and the rest are for rejection at this point. I would like to say, um, I, would, I would still like to send to the consultants our concerns um, because I, I think it will all end up in a better place um, if, if we can all have reports that look more similar and Char I, and Megan, I really want to thank you for, for offering that to us. You know, it may be that we see such a difference in the next few days. We'll feel, we'll feel different, but um, thank you for, thank you for hearing us today. Uh, before we totally change topics, I'm sorry, I would raise my hand, but there's so many hands up. I think it would go unnoticed. Um, this is Brittany and I just wanted to um, suggest that with any individual comments that anybody has on how they would like to see the report, um, you know, the recommendations prioritized, if you could please email those um, directly to Gail, I guess, and I'm, I'm not sure if I can be CC'd. Um, that way, if we can say like that, this is regarding this particular sector these are the bullet points of what we want are our priorities in this order that 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 would be really helpful for to be able to to put them all together in one place and um, save a little bit of time. Thank you. Travis, can I then share those with a consultant if I'm going to be a point of contact? I mean, because I, I hear Char and Megan, they really do want this information. Um, you know, a lot of it's available listening to recording, but could I then share that information with the consultant? I'm sorry, this is William from Department of Health. Um, if there's going to be any sharing of uh, information like that via email, I think Travis should make a determination of that as well, because it's my understanding that multiple people on an email is not allowed by the Sunshine Laws, but I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I can protect anyone, but I just want to make sure we're all covered on that. You can so you can, yeah. I think you already clarified. Yeah, he was correct, but the uh, it it doesn't uh, affect your ability to forward that information to the consultants. Okay, so as I understood earlier, you clarified that folks could send individually to me as long as they don't copy anyone else. And right, then they written. can only have a discussion with you, and yeah. then you okay. cannot share that information with anyone else. But you can send it to the consultants because they're not officially members of the task force. Oh, well, I thought we got a determination that I could then send it to Brittany who could collate this. I, I, I understood that. And then Brittany sends it to the, to the uh, consultants. Is that what's going to happen? Well, I guess it, well, it doesn't matter if the consultants get hit twice, although they probably prefer collated information. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I guess the question is, and maybe that's what Liam was trying to uh, clarify was, um, if folks send me this information, I understood from what you're saying before, then I could send it to Brittany to collate as long as there's no discussion. Right, you just can't discuss the substance substance of it. If it's administrative, I, I don't see an issue with that. Okay, and either one of us can forward that to the consultants and I'm sure they would prefer it in a collated form. That would sure. Be okay, all right, okay. All right, well, I think we're clear right. on all that. I, I just wanna make it, I just wanna make it clear that the, the rule allows to have one-on-one -on -one communications. It just can't be serial, right? So you can have discussions about 
with you and Robert can have a discussion, but it can't be serial, meaning you can't have that same discussion mm -hmm. with Brittany, right? I don't think anyone's going to talk to anyone for about okay. three days. Uh, right. I just want to make it clear. <laughs> no, I'm always making a bad joke, but thank you for, for clarifying. That. <laughs> okay. Just if we have more time next, um, we have a series of meetings, and I think we are 20 minutes over the uh, allotted time. So. Yeah, and you know, I didn't know DOH was back there. Thank you for sitting through this. I want to make a big mahalo to DOA as well. Um, this is not an easy job for any of us. I mean, all of us have really good intentions involved. So we'll we'll keep um we'll keep that in mind as we move forward. So thank you all. And I guess that's it, yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, like there's no objection uh, from the members. Uh, we can adjourn now the meeting. Sounds so good. The meeting, is, the, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> Thank you, June. You're awesome. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.